So Charles Barkley, your friend, he used to be one of your favorite players. Charles Barkley used to be my favorite player. Tell me about it. He's not my favorite player now, not because I don't like him. It's because my boys are my favorite players now. Okay, so your favorite player uh, was on Mike and Mike this morning. And he um, had something to say about your playing time in college and then your overall approach to the media. So let's take a listen and then I want to get your response. Okay. Got to understand, Mike, they probably weren't interviewing guys who average two points a game in college. So now he's getting his interviews and everybody's going to put him on because he says catchy stuff. But listen, like I said, I think his kid's probably the number one player in the draft. And I wish he would let his kid shine. I mean, listen, once I found out he averaged two points a game, listen, you need to slow your roll. You said I didn't win the championship, and I, and I said to myself, I need to go back and Google this guy because maybe I missed the ball era when he was dominating and winning <laughs> championship everywhere. He missed the ball era when you were dominating and winning hey, championships everywhere. That's what I'm talking about. See, Charles got to go Google me for what? <laughs> he wants some press. I'm not going to Google Charles. He want to play one on one or what all this, and he said I average two points. Who cares? I know he don't want to play no one on one because he's too big. He better stay behind them TNT and eat them donuts. Uh huh. But uh, uh -huh. he said that he wanted to go one on one with you. He don't want to do. He's just talking. He just want more press now. See, the only thing he's talking about ain't nobody. He ain't even talking about basketball no more. He just got to come at me so he can stay relevant. Cause it looked like he fade now. Uh -huh. Poor Charles. Poor That's Charles. my boy, but poor Charles. Poor Charles. Okay, so he'll be all right though. I'll, I'll send him some Krispy Kreme donuts, and you know he'll be my friend again. So Chuck, if you're listening, you can respond to that. Meanwhile, uh, did you hear what he had to say? He said he wants you to let his boys play. Is there any truth to that that you're taking hey, from them playing? How am I stopping them from playing? They out on the court. If you stop somebody, that means you gotta tie them up and put them to the side. I just watched my boys play the same thing they've been doing for years. It's just the way I talk about them and the way they play. He's just getting it all on camera now. But it's good for conversation. <laughs> it's good for conversation. You know that. But I ain't taking no shot. My boys, if you that good, you shine on the court. Don't shine from what I'm saying. All right. So um, we've talked about you and your, your take on how you handle uh, your boys and how they don't respond. They don't talk back because you right, don't raise right, boys right. like that. And you're okay with every, all the attention, negative or positive, that you receive. Well, it comes with the territory. And that's how you feel arenas. Like everybody wants to shut me up, but they can't. Mm, uh huh. You see, my boys go out there, and you know what? Let my boys finish whooping your tail on the court while you paying attention to what I'm saying on the outside. There was a, a statement that you made in a recent interview. They said all the talk that you're doing could make more people want to come at Lonzo when he gets in the league. Come at Lonzo? I, and see, that's what all the reporters and everybody say on the mm -hmm. outside. To say, hey. When Lonzo get there, you all heard what I said. Mm -hmm. Get to him. I don't think not one player worried about getting Alonzo. They worried about playing, making their money, and trying to win. All right. So tell me about the tournament. You made a declaration early in the season. Yes. UCLA wins it all. Well, UCLA wins it all. You and I still that. stay true to that. I ain't going to be like, you know what? I don't think they might not win now. Shoot. Any uh, hesitation in what you saw? They didn't win the Pac-12 tourney, so you see I that. I never said they're going to win the Pac-12 tournament. What, you, I said? what they have on the court, though. Yes. You still okay with the capable uh, hey. assignments? I'm going to tell you this. I told my boy this. There's three levels of play. Tell me about Regular it. Regular season, then you got playoff mode, and then you got a championship mode. Okay. And he knows he got to keep going up. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I do appreciate you. You're making me laugh. So I, hey, I'm, trying to, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to keep it <laughs> composed as a journalist. But you are funny, and I know you understand what you're doing. Yes. People have said to me, he reminds me of Earl Woods. Uh, you have a, a bit of Richard Williams to you as well. Um, is there a method to what some would say is method? Oh, no. First of all, you, you're talking about Venus and Serena's dad. That's a single sport. Mm -hmm. Tiger Woods, that's a single sport. They don't have, one of them got girls, the other one got one boy, I got three boys. So you're trying to compare me to them, but you can't. In terms of how you approach, in terms of how you instill, in terms of their work ethic, in terms of what you want them to do and how well, you want I them think to every, create Well, I, I think every father that's got some successful kids is kind of like that. Okay. But uh, everybody has the same thing. They want the best for their kids, especially as parents. You just don't videotape everybody like somebody's playing piano really good right now uh -huh. and they, their parents are saying you're the best orchestra i ever seen in my life <laughs> but ain't nobody want to hear that because ain't nobody trying to watch no piano
Okay. Before I let you go, we were told that the home was burglarized last night. Is everybody okay? Is everybody Oh, everybody's okay? all right. Chino Hill's got the best neighborhood watch in the world. Okay. As soon as you bust a window, they calling in police. <laughs> That's all they did was break a window. And that was it? Yeah, that was it. Everybody's okay. Everybody, I wish I was there. They wouldn't be. It ain't hard to get in my house. It's hard to get out. Uh-oh. Okay. All righty. Oh, it's coast to coast, guys. Uh, breaking news with LeVar Ball. He's, he is something, ain't he? Um, thank you so much for joining hey, us. I appreciate you. you. I appreciate you, sweetheart. Yes, Thanks so very much. much. Okay. All right. Back in a moment. To the Spurs foul. Should Miami go for the three right away? James catches, puts up the three. Long go. Rebound box. Back out to Allen. One of the most famous shots in NBA Finals history and the author of said shot, Ray Allen, joins us now on behalf of the Polaris Slingshot, a unique three-wheeled moto roadster. Uh, Ray, that moment four years ago in Miami, all the, all the fans, a lot of them had streamed out. They couldn't get back into the building. What sticks with you about that, that shot? What's up, David? Um, so much, so much sticks, up, uh, sticks with me about that shot. Um, I think first and foremost, just the fact that I shot that shot, you know, at least uh, 60, 70 times that day, early in the morning and then right before the game. And to be able to be put in that situation, it was almost like I didn't think about it. I didn't breathe. I didn't blink. I just got to where my comfort zone was. And uh, everybody got to see it unfold uh, in that situation at that moment. Uh, but it was something that I was so comfortable and used to doing. I know that the police tape was up trying to keep the crowds back and all that stuff, and then you came up. Really, it was as close as a team has ever been to not winning a finals and then coming back and winning it. You guys were on the brink, and you pulled it out. Um, and, and then, Ray, uh, you considered a comeback, I know, last summer. Some teams were contacted, like the Warriors and Cavs. Why ultimately did you decide, that's it, I'm done, don't want to play anymore? Well, I mean, I obviously... Um I was looking into it and I, and I was kind of making this last ditch attempt at trying to figure out if this was something that I wanted to do or if I would, it was time for me to hang up, hang it up. And um, there was just, you know, there was interest and people talked about it and they were like, you know, we could use him, but there was, nobody was knocking my socks off and uh, giving me any great ideas or, or presentation for me to, to really suit up with them. So I was like, you know, I've had a great 18 years. I've overachieved, in my opinion. Uh, to be able to win two championships um, is incredible. I never imagined I'd be able to win one. So I was able to say, you know what, I can ride off in the sunset and let it go. What's it like, Ray? What's it like being a retired NBA player now? Uh, it's the strangest thing in the world because for most of my life, I've always had a schedule. I've always had somewhere I had to be Somebody's checking your body fat. Uh, somebody's making sure you got 10 lifts in a month in the weight room. And now, for me, I'm accountable to, to my own growth or my lack of growth, whatever it may be. So um, what I learned now is to eat right, to eat better, um, to challenge myself in my own ways, to run, to ride, to lift weights. And uh, whatever, everything I've learned over my 20 some plus, 25 plus years of playing basketball, I don't want to lose them. I want to kind of improve on them and make myself uh, a little bit better. All right, so the, the routine of an NBA game or an NBA season is gone. Your routine was, was, was legendary. I, mean, I know you would like, you'd take a nap and then you'd have your, your chicken for lunch and then you'd go to the arena. And you talked about how many shots you would get up, Ray. How many do you think you would shoot before a game? Just, just getting loose. Um, before a game, I probably shot... 150 to 170 shots and you know there's this misconception out there like kids walk up to me all the time and they say should I shoot a thousand shots a day or they think there's this big number for your practice you know for your routine and I tell them it's important that you get the right shots up you know I'll, if you shoot a thousand shots I'll show you a thousand bad shots that you're shooting you know shoot fourth quarter shots those shots that you have a seven footer running at you and you got to get the shot off over his outstretched arm or hand. And if you practice that shot every single moment you take a shot, that's when you're putting yourself ready to shoot these shots in games. And, and too often I walk in the gym and I see kids just kind of going through the motions, getting shots up, they're not sweating, they're not moving. 
And then they'll shoot and walk out of the gym and they say they got a workout in, but they're actually going to fail the minute they go and have to take that game shot. They're actually, their body's not going to be ready for it. So my career, I've taken that game shot, you know, that fourth quarter shot every single day, every routine. And then I shoot free throws in between because I know you need pressure on you. And the only way to do that is to do that when you're sweating heavily and you just went through an intense workout. I did a little research here. I know you said at one point you feel like you, you have a mild case of OCD. How did that manifest itself in your career as a basketball player? Well, I started thinking about all the things that uh, I can do or I can't do. And when I got to the NBA, I was thinking, you know, how am I going to help a team win? You know, the likes of Michael Jordan, Reggie Miller, Mitch Richmond, um, all these great players that are in the league, Clyde Drexler, that are playing, and how am I going to have an impact? So I started thinking, I said, well, let's control the things that I can control, like being on time, um, like, you know, giving extra effort, uh, like doing extra work, uh, like knowing the plays, like all these things. And so I started becoming very anal about them, you know, being on time, being early is being on time. Um, you know, being the first one in line, doing all the routines. If there was, if we were doing a figure eight in practice, I made sure that I was at the front of the line and tried to figure out and learn everything I need to learn. So before you know it, I started figuring everything out. And then I started wanting things the way they're supposed to be every time so I can figure them out and I never got behind. And um, before you know it, I started really learning how to shoot and learning the routine and sticking to the guys that really could shoot on a team and uh, those guys made me better, and I made them better, and then ultimately I, I got the hang of it, and then I became really good at it. You sure did. The best shooter in the game in your time, the NBA's all-time leader in three-pointers made, three made, Ray Allen, joining us today on Coast to Coast. Ray, we appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Thank you, David.